and good afternoon, I guess, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, right? Yes, and thank you for doing this so early in the morning. This is amazing. So yes, yeah, so let's we'll get started. We are getting started. We have a recording. So um, this is Think and Link. Uh, this is an event we put on. It used to be called Think and Link Pants Optional, which is uh, taken up a bit of fire um, in <laughs> Mark's post. Um, we changed it not because of him, but because we're in the new year. Um, brand new world. I think in like brand new world is the new name. Uh, it's the season. It's a little more hopeful, and we'll explain that more in a post coming up. But it's um, not as good as pants optional. I have to say immediately, right? <laughs> pants optional was way better. And why I is know, that? I know. <laughs> and why is that? So that you had that on. <laughs> there well, were some look, videos I, floating around. It's important to point out, though, right? That we that we most of us are you, you wearing pants? Are you Aaron? I assume. I am, I am. And I have worn pants for every single one of these Thinking Link events. You're lying. You're definitely lying. Most <laughs> of them do these things in boxer shorts at best. But anyway, sorry, carry on anyway. I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm... I want to get a word in for our sponsors. Uh, our two sponsors, Capsule, this firm in Minneapolis uh, that does mm -hmm. uh, special project work uh, in the area of name, brand, brand strategy, research, design, and a variety of forms. Uh, and then an example of that work, which is also a sponsor, Verse Chocolate, which is a wonderful new chocolate that's a healthy habit chocolate coming out of Holland, Michigan. Yes, there it is, Verse Chocolate. You can go buy some now. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and those are our two wonderful sponsors. If, if anybody else wants to sponsor this, you know, personally in any other way, happy to take that on. But for now, that's who we have. And um, we're here to have a, a dis discussion about brand about marketing, uh, about design-related topics with professor, virtual professor Mark Ritson, who has become an institution in, of, in and of himself um, in what he's doing now, which I find really intriguing on a modern level. Uh, and just put out a post this morning, I believe, or at least it hit my world about brand strategy, which I read and enjoyed and laughed at a number of times. Avoid anybody with a title strategist, that's good. So um, that's us. We ask that you be on audio mute, video on if you like for everybody because we love seeing video. And we're gonna have a conversation. It's gonna go about forty-five minutes. And Kelly's gonna start with the first question of my. I book. am, but I do want to mention really quickly because I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of questions from the audience as well. So please put those questions in the chat. We will try to get to as many of those as we can in the time we have left. Uh, but we will also be recording and have a video of this full session. So Mark, uh, we're excited to have this conversation and then put this back out into the world. Um, and I expect a very sweary conversation, please. That's what we all anticipate as we move through this next 45 don't have, minutes. <laughs> don't, one of the things I promised myself was I would not swear because I remember from my days in, in Minnesota that it was not it didn't go down as well as it goes down elsewhere. So you will not get a single curse word from me in the, in the next 45 minutes. I've, I've been training. If it slips you out, we're okay. But thank yeah, you, yeah. Mark. Uh, yeah. Now we're very, obviously very excited to have you. Um, I think for, for many of us, you know, over the past decade, you have entertained and enlightened us with your unique take on, on a lot of um, hot topics in marketing. Um, and uh, contrarian of sorts, some would say, but what we want to talk about today is just get some perspectives on what we, what you see as some of the hot topics in marketing um, and uh, just have a conversation. So I will dive right in, if okay, Mark, and just ask you a quick question. A recent sure. article that I read um, and then a podcast I heard of yours around marketing bothism and what your definition of bothism, that model, which I think for the group is, is uh, a combination of, of, of strategy, creativity, and how can marketers harness that sort of one-two punch. Can you dive into your definition of bothism mm. and how that applies to marketing and marketers today? Sure. Um, so it happened yesterday is a good example. Someone was asking me um, for my point of view and what was more important, was it, um, media placement or was it the creation and content of the ad that was the most important in generating success and i politely said to that person that, that the question was stupid because it was clearly a, a case of both being important right if you have shitty media choices great creativity isn't going to work and great creativity um 
is is the big driver behind advertising effectiveness um, uh, alongside good media. Uh, and so that's a good example of bothism. We live in an age where, especially in marketing for some reason, it's about whether you do short-term, bottom of funnel performance marketing or top of funnel brand building. The answer obviously is you do both. You do long and short, you know, digital or traditional is possibly the dumbest question in the history of marketing, right? Yeah. Digital or traditional, right? Neither term means anything given that everything is digital anyway. But again, the answer is both. If you want to, you know, if you look at any piece of research ever, including the research of Facebook and most of the TV companies, Facebook works best when twinned with television. You get a, a, a catalytic impact. Um, you need them both. So bothism is just my attempt to point out that you really want both uh, of the two things that we try and separate so often these days uh, online. Um, and people like, uh, what's a good example? Gary V, who I regard as useless, um, are a perfect example of someone who exposes one side of the coin and it serves him very well but it's 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 not good for brands to think that way so yeah bothism means try and do you know it's not a or b it's not even a plus b it's a times b that the two together mm -hmm. produce the best results and they inevitably do that's, yeah, great. that's good so it's that that really good. equilibrium if you will a balance of right right thank you yeah that's great thank so you, I um I need this to, so when we this goes way back we get historic I can't help but do that but after taking your class this is pre the internet this is ninety seven not pre internet pre -internet. Really, but it was, <laughs> right right just just to be clear you didn't have gray hair I didn't have gray hair uh, and we got together and we uh, a number of times not romantically we should make things. that clear we should make that no, clear it wasn't we, don't need to, we don't need to make that clear um no we uh <laughs> we uh and i was so enamored what was happening to the internet and what was what that was i got this thing like it's going to be everything and you said no no really it's just going to consume everything it's going to consume all the other <laughs> mediums out there do you ever go back to that article or back because that you had just written something about that and go back and look at your yeah. stuff to see if it's come true because part of what, I mean, it's a pundit, you have to look into the future like that. Yeah, no, I, I do remember that. I, first of all, I remember you being very passionate about it, which sounds obvious now, but at the time wasn't, you know, it was 25 plus years ago, whatever it was. And I do remember my own argument, which was that, yeah, it became the medium by which everything else went through. I, I think obviously it's, it's kind of a bit of both now, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's, um, I, I think it became really with 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 digital media. That's when we saw the full fruition of it. When we were talking back in the nineties, it was the in, you know it was, it was the internet, the existence of the web that was the thing we were discussing. I think it was only when we got from that stage through the social media stage organic social media, which was, in my opinion, ridiculous, right? I mean, that was when I really started to lose my mind a little bit. And that was probably what, about 10 years ago now, if you remember, Zuckerberg had been talking about how we weren't going to do advertising anymore. Um, what was going to happen was people going to be friends with brands, organic social media, conversations. But there's a lot of people still believe that's the case, right? And it was never the case. The reach was never there. Social media was a social media. It wasn't for brands to have a conversation with consumers. The Oreo dunk in the dark, remember that from the Super Bowl, was possibly the dumbest moment in the 25 years since we last met, right? Because so many people believed that that tweet during the Super Bowl was some kind of revelation, and it reached literally less than 0.1% of the ads that were running on the TV show. Yeah. And, and yet when you read advertising age, even, you know, the Wall Street Journal the next morning, they were claiming that Dunk in the Dark was, you know, had won the Internet. So I think that was bullshit. I think when we got to what I would call digital media, so not organic social media, but but essentially using Facebook as a or YouTube as a traditional media source running ads 
that's when you got to the place where I think a proper revolution occurred. And as we now know, 50% of the money goes on it. So yeah, yeah I remember yeah. it well, but we were at the time we were debating whether the internet was going to change things. You know what I mean? It's come on so much. It's hard to even know what is the internet now, right? I mean, what, yeah, exactly. it's everything and everywhere. And the fact that we're having this call with Australia, you know, this is absolutely yeah. amazing to me that this is to look back on that. Yeah. Um, I don't want to steal the whole show, Kelly. So no, 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 no. I've got so many questions. I know we won't get to end. There are a lot showing up in the chat, but but yes. quickly, Mark, to staying in the theme of digital and marketing in this digital age, and and again, something I'd read that you had had, had discussed with regard to you know current senior senior expert marketers um, either looking for jobs. Um, or are transitioning to new roles. And knowing that digital is a critical part of the marketing playbook, but it's not, and you've said this, not the playbook itself. Um, can you share a little bit about the current role of, a, of marketing and a marketer in this digital age? And better yet, the, um, you know, who, whom are they serving as a practice if they practice their discipline? We think about digital and how that is woven. Yeah. Is woven. yeah. It, it's a key key question, Kelly, and you asked it very well in the sense that marketers in a digital age, I think, is the right way to think about it. I think the minute we get digital marketing, we enter a much more difficult territory. Mm -hmm. And the problem with digital marketing is it's inherently tactical. And and I, I'm often quoted a lot and so, oh, you know, uh, Ritson's against digital. He doesn't think digital, none of which is true. I think digital has a massive, clearly a massive place in all of this. And if you wanted to say what it would be, it's approximately half the tactical impact of communications, right? Mm -hmm. um, for example. So digital by its nature is the tactics we use, which are quote unquote digital. Come back upstream with me, though. What marketers have to do before they do tactics is strategy. Yeah. yeah, Strategy and tactics are not the same thing. They're connected. But strategy is about answering the key questions that will direct the tactics. It's the generals at the top of the hill planning where the soldiers will go before the soldiers go. Right. And I, I don't see any role. When someone talks about digital strategy, I know we're in a place of stupidity because no such thing exists. The car is in front of the horse, right? We're going to do digital tactics, but strategy is strategy. And putting digital in front of it tells you that you don't know what you're doing. Now, you can have a digital marketer, but that market is relatively junior and is relatively wrapped up in tactical stuff, right? And again, nothing wrong with that. But what we're seeing right now in many places is those digital marketers who are now in their 30s are trying to swim upstream, earn more money, become more strategic, become more senior. But they're hanging on to the D word. And I have to be honest with you, they know very little about marketing mm -hmm. and a lot more about digital. And, and that's not a bad thing because, you know, God knows I'm making money out of training them. And I welcome them coming up, by the way, because, you know, if you don't have digital tactical skills it's pretty hard to be any good these days but you do have to drop the d prefix to come and do marketing properly and that means strategy and just to finish our you know a trilogy tactics is is the tip of the spear mm -hmm. then there's the strategy and before strategy there's the diagnosis the understanding the market on which the strategy is based the battle plan the strategy then the troops and for me, the answer to your question is those three things are what a good marketer does. Understand the market, develop a strategy, execute tactics off the strategy. What we see, I would say six times out of 10, is no real focus on diagnosis, absolutely no strategy, no strategy at all. And even when we get to tactics, a, a almost total focus on communications and ignoring the other tactical levers. We see very little discussion of price anymore within marketing, product development, distribution, and an almost total obsession with comms and digital comms, which if you think about these three phases and the fact that comms is a quarter of the four Ps, as McCarthy would once have said, then we're talking about 8% of the total marketing mix. That 8% of marketing comms and the 4% of, you know, the half of it, which is digital comms, occupies about 70% of our conversation. 
and we yeah. miss all the other parts, which for me is a tragedy. Yeah. yeah. I add on top of that the fact that it's it's a it's a shallow medium. All the things related to it is generally delivered through a screen of some sort. You know, it's not as it's not as human connection yeah. kind of form. Right? But it, look, but it is effective. Don't get me wrong. I mean. It, as a 4% in the overall marketing journey, it, it certainly has its place. But, you know, what's happened to pricing in our conversations, you know, as marketers, what's happened to strategy, what's happened to segmentation, these are rich conversations. And we just, we just don't, got your next marketing conference, virtual or not, count how many session, sessions are on about comms and how many are on about other things. Yeah, and it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. And I, if I can, if I may, Aaron, um, Mark, just continue really quickly, because this is part of, again, hot off the press, uh, um, an article you'd written around brand strategy and what you call the three axioms and then the three questions you would ask associated with that. Yeah. Talk about diagnosis first and then strategy about in terms of choosing what you will not do. Could you yep. go a little bit deeper into that or just give some additional perspective? Yeah. Please. It's a big one, right? It's a real big one, Kelly. So axioms is a fancy way of saying there are three things I think you need to be aware of when you're doing strategy, right? Before you actually do strategy. We've kind of talked about two of them. Put the tactics down, super important. You can't have a Facebook strategy. So put it, put Facebook and all other shit down. Step back to, to the strategic questions. Build it on diagnosis, which you've already talked about. That's another uh, axiom. And then, you know, for me, I think this, this I don't know how to describe it, but this um, inherent focus on strategic thinking um, really demands that we ask these four questions, um, three main questions really, um, before we do anything else, you know? And the first question is who we're targeting. The next question is what do we stand for? What's our position? And our final question is, What's our objectives? And that's it. That's all we're talking about. We get a lot of people turning up, you know, with ooh, you know, brand strategy, marketing strategy, and even worse, I'm a strategist, right? My experience of strategists is that they know nothing of strategy, right? There are certain flags you'll see on LinkedIn. Anyone who refers to themselves as a strategist is the opposite of strategy. It's almost as bad as being an author, um, putting that on your LinkedIn title. Um, <laughs> Or using a verb, that's the ultimate one, using a verb in your LinkedIn title, thinking, doing, challenging, it means you're useless, okay? So um, my, my point is that, you know, brand or marketing strategy has these axioms that drive how we do things. And then if you boil it down, what is a brand strategy? It really isn't that complex. It's who we're targeting, what's our position and what are our objectives, you know? Those are the, those are the key drivers of the process. And the axiom that surrounds it the most, and the one I learned from the strategy people, and it took me a long time to learn is, is strategy is what we do not do. So when you answer these questions, who are we targeting? What do we stand for? What's our objectives? The classic mistake is to try and do everything or try and do too much. And one of the uh, Americans have added relatively little words to the English language of any value, okay? I would say uh, hot dog, I would say motherfucker, but I'm not swearing, so I'm not going to use that word on the on the podcast. And the other one is choiceful, okay? Choiceful. It's an abysmal word, but my goodness, it's a great word too, because choicefulness suggests that you've made choices. You've decided what we're not going to do. And when it comes to marketing or brand strategy, targeting, who are we not going after? Where will we focus our money? Positioning. I, I've positioned more billion dollar brands than anyone on this call, right? Doesn't mean I'm smarter, but I've certainly done it a lot, right? I know that if you have more than two or three fundamental things in your brand positioning, it's not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to get it down. And I see all these brands with triangles and keyholes and 25 words and a, a brand purpose and brand essence and brand position and brand this and brand that. It's over because you didn't make the choices of what you didn't want to stand for. And the same with objectives. Done a ton of research on this. A handful of objectives going into a, a year, three or four, is the optimum number, all things being equal, to have success. If you have seven, eight, nine, ten imperatives, 
Those aren't imperatives. Those aren't objectives. Those are dreams that will never come true. So I really think it's one of the most important points. You know, as I said in the article, morons keep adding more and more. Good marketers keep chopping away. And if you ever see a great choiceful strategy, it's, it, it's, the line of sight is very clear and it delivers as a result. Thank you. Hey, Rebecca. That's great. Yes. And very timely, I think, now for marketers trying to be more focused on what they need to need to do in their business. And um, I have to go historic again. Oh, I, I <laughs> just going to say, Aaron, it's very important, though, just to point that out. You, you've got to be very critical on brands, on, on the work that you do. When you look at most brands and most marketers and you look at their brand or marketing strategy as obvious as the things i'm saying they haven't done it there isn't clarity on targeting there isn't clarity on positioning and there aren't the two or three objectives that really are going to drive this do you know what i mean so although this all sounds obvious i'm telling you nine times out of ten those questions have not been sufficiently answered sorry we're going to go historical yeah yeah it's uh, historic but also to go current as well because there's the follow-on question to my first question will be, have brands and marketers lost their way? Which is a question from our audience from John Gleason. But before that, which kind of feeds into that, is um, a video, uh, an event that you attended. It was um, Brand Valuation Brilliant or Bullshit, uh, which is something that we've promoted pretty heavily because um, uh, the emotional response that I had to it, as I, got, as I watched you go up there and um, tear apart uh, three different brand valuation firms. I think they flew you in. They probably sponsored and paid and put you up in a nice hotel and everything else. And then you just crushed them. And I had a, a fight or flight instinct. I think the flight was more like I would have just, if I was on that panel um, and I was one of those three, I would have just walked out of the room. I was just like, I, just, I can't, I can't do that. Um, then I watched them try to counter you. The last guy came pretty close. I don't remember what his name was. And I think he was the one that started the one at Land the interbrand guy, yeah. The interbrand, interbrand guy was guy. pretty good. Yeah. He was pretty good. He had a good argument, but um, fairly good argument for it. But he had crushed them before they could even get started. And the one guy was like, Well, I'll address Mark's comments in the question and answer. And <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> you lost. Anyway, you still, what is your view on brand valuation? Um, still worthy? Still, is it, I mean, it, is it even something the brand should be doing? to look at the asset. Yeah, the yeah look, th let, let's separate it out. So brand valuation as exemplified by the league tables, by brand Z, by brand finance, um, certainly by interbrand is a massive bag of shit. Yeah, a total bag of shit. And, and to explain Aaron's point, what if you actually, whenever you produce a league table, every lazy marketing journalist goes, ooh, you know, that's number one, and that one's gone up three places, and that one's gone down two places. And the league itself, the table, the numbers is horseshit. And you know it's horseshit because essentially, uh, as I pointed out in this talk that Aaron said, all I did was I dug out the data. So, you know, these companies tell you what a brand is worth, right, on the balance sheet. They estimate it. Well, all, all I and a Swiss firm called Marketables did is we said, right, over the last 20 years, you guys have been saying these brands are worth the following. We've looked at every instance where a brand was sold in the year that you put a value on it, and none of you have got within 300% of it in some cases, right? On average, you know, and it's like a real estate agent say, I'm going to value your house, and I'm either 100% off, you know, it's worth 500,000 bucks. I said it was going to be worth a million bucks, or I said it was going to be worth 250,000 bucks. That's how, that's how off they all were. So the league tables are all horseshit, right? They're just a PR pile of horseshit, and, and it's pretty easy to demolish. Having said that, I do believe in brand valuation, and I've been involved many times in brand valuation, because although the league tables are horseshit, where they're guessing, if you get a valuation firm to come in, do the research, spend proper time on it, and then put the, the intangible asset value on the balance sheet, either to protect or sell or drive the thing, there is value in that, I believe. Having said that, the rhetoric, you know, every half-trained market, a well-intentioned will say, oh, putting brands on the balance sheet. Oh, you know, we're finally getting the respect we deserve. Go and look at the league tables between brand Z and interbrand, the two big ones. We cannot agree within a billion, a hundred billion dollars what Google is worth. You know what I mean? 
So it's a bit of a big pile of rubbish, in my opinion. Yeah. The yeah. theory is great. The theory is great. Yeah. The, yeah. the practice is bullshit. That's funny. So you bring up Google, which is a great one because we're on the book tour, the Physics of Brand book tour, and um, we go to Google and they and they sit down with the brand leadership team. And the first thing they say to us is, we don't have a brand. Google said that. <laughs> Google said that. We don't have a brand. And, I, and I'm should. like, well, that's, that's an interesting statement <laughs> in itself, right? I'm like, and you, you, the argument was, I think, that they, you know, that they are the, the plumbing, right? They are, the, they are a good portion of the internet, right? And so therefore, they don't have a brand. You know, and I yeah, sat there and I'm like, oh, whoever that's said, interesting. Whoever, the, whoever said that to you was an idiot, right? They, <laughs> you know, for about a hundred different reasons. I mean, you can make an argument. Yeah. I don't believe in it. The brands are becoming less important, right? I mean, my mate, the great Scott Galloway, is continually saying that uh, brands are becoming less important in the information age. I think that's horseshit too. But anyone from Google who says we don't have a brand is, uh, well, they want to, they maybe want to find out why they were spent, or they've upped their advertising brand building spend by about, you know, uh, yeah. $300 million this year. Well, if, you know, either it's not working or the person who said that has no idea what they're talking about, right? Right. Nonsense. That's yeah. great. So yeah. <laughs> Kelly, I'll let you yeah, take it. I, I would just love to get, there was a question. I think it's Ozzy or Azzy. I hope I'm not butchering your name, but it's a great question. I think we have a lot of entrepreneurs on the call today, Mark, who are yeah. thinking, okay, this big brands, big budgets. I'm a startup or I'm a marketer for a startup um, who don't have the access to those resources per se, certainly early in the, in the, in the lifetime or the life of the brand. Um, and they rely on building communities organically, right? Rather than through paid media. So how would you recommend, or do you have some thoughts you could share on startups, marketers working for startups, how do they manage? And is there a different approach to brand strategy and thus marketing a brand based on that lack of resources that you could share? Yeah. So there's two things that like good news and bad news. Let's do the bad news, which no one ever says in America. Um, on this particular point, but it's super important, right? I get this question a lot, um, especially if you go and give a talk about brand building and you talk about, you know, you have to have an excess share of voice, you have to spend across many channels, um, you have to maintain your presence in the market. And people with small brands say, but I, I haven't got the funds to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I can't afford to do that stuff. What do I do? And I always say the same thing, which is you stay small, you stay small, right? Let's be very clear about this nonsense, which comes out of America about David V. Goliath, you know? Ooh, the small brands, right? The small brands are more agile and D to C and they're beating up the big brands. What utter bullshit, right? There is still that belief that, um, what's the Razor brand that everyone parps on about that Unilever bought? Do you remember, Aaron? Is what, what's Harry? the Razor? Is it which one? Not Harry's, no. which yeah. one? Uh, not the one that ran the commercial or ran the had the, yeah. the video at the beginning that was like Dollar Shave Club. Popular. Dollar, Dollar, Shave Club. Club. Dollar, Shave yeah. Dollar Shave Club, right? There's still a belief that um, Dollar Shave Club somehow beat Gillette. No, they didn't. They still haven't made a profit, right? This D to C nonsense that goes on. Um, small brands stay small. That, that's yeah. just the way that it goes, okay? You never actually, you know, very rarely do you see a brand break that myth. The most important driver of effectiveness when it comes to brand building, what's the number one driver that makes your branding efforts successful is you're already a big brand. Not what you're spending, but you've already built tremendous physical, mental availability and you're leveraging that in your communications. Never go past that part, right? Mm. that we keep telling this story in advertising age about the small D to C brands. They're all useless. They don't make any money. Stop it. It's just bullshit from people trying to sell their companies. D to C is a joke. They're in target within about eight months of launching. It's rubbish, right? Mm. So the first point is, and I don't mean to be sound um, negative. I'm being realistic. Small brands, because they cannot do a lot of this stuff, will stay small and then disappear. That's the rule of the jungle, right? That's how capitalism works. It was never fair, right? And there's this parlayed mythological stuff. Oh, the small brands win. One or two do, and we write lots of stories about them, but mostly they get smashed, right? And never make it. Having said that, if you accept that that's the case, there's a couple of lessons for smaller brands. 
the first brand uh, lesson I would say is play the founder, play your smallness as a strength. Mm -hmm. The second one is pick an enemy, right? The most successful small brand strategy is to position and reflect against a bigger brand yeah. in order to use their strength almost in a judo way against them and to fuel you. And then the other thing is I don't think brand management starts until about year five. So I, I work for Sephora in San Francisco. I have done for a very long time. And we have a thing called, um, I'm sorry, what, how much I can say about it. We pick um, two or three of the hottest beauty brands each year. And I go and work with them to build them into the next stage of growth. One of the things we call it incubator. And we've worked with a lot of famous brands that have become very successful over the years. Um, one of my rules I put in place when we started that program is they have to be five years old. And the reason they have to be five years old is before then, it's not, it's still prototypical. So I don't think you need a brand strategy from year one to year five. What you need is a marketing strategy and you need to see where you land, right? Once you get to year five, you're maybe profitable. You've got a bit of growth. You've got some heritage. You've got loyal customers. Things have started to settle down. You can start to do the research and the strategy until year five, you know, just survive. And that's important because, you know, it's like having kids, right? We all have kids thinking they're going to be doctors and nurses and mine have all turned out to be criminals and, and minor yeah. criminals and so forth. And it's a bit like brands, you know, you have this vision for what a brand will be when you launch it. But it, if it is successful, it finds its own way. And it's only once it's found that way that you should do the, the branding thing. Don't do it too early. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a mistake. Okay, so it's more small tactics. So mass targeting, test and learn, build awareness, and then make a shift as you as you move through. As I yeah, be, a... be, be flexible. Be flexible is the key point. It, you know, um, one of the brands I I, dis, I discovered that I, um, I, I encountered when I was in Minneapolis was Belvedere, and Ed Phillips was launching Belvedere, mm -hmm. and came to my class in '96 to talk about it about a luxury vodka. And I and my whole um, MBA class thought he was a lunatic, right? You couldn't have luxury vodka. And then weirdly about oh, 18, 19 years later, I was working for Moa Tennessee when we acquired Belvedere. And I had a drink with Ed 20 years later. So he'd been in my classroom <laughs> launching this liquor brand. And then here we were in Paris having a drink. And he didn't remember me, but I certainly remembered him. And one of the big lessons was he had this vision, but it went somewhere else in order to become successful. So give it, you know, just like children, give it a bit of flex and let it find its way. Um, don't be too structured at the start. You're not PNG. Let it flip and flop a little bit at the beginning. That's that's a key lesson. Guys like me, and I, I mean, and Aaron and you, and, and I mean this in the nicest sense, we're artificial, right? You use someone like me to work out what's in the brand and then lock it down and grow it and scale it and all of that. And, you know, I've done that throughout my career. We're great, but we're not the source of it. Let the source grow and firm first before you bring in people like us to do the work. That's great. Thank uh, you. <laughs> that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Plus his one of, I think it's one of his kids became a Senator. If I've got that right as a story, not maybe his brother, but maybe his. Anyway, uh, so there you go, right? That worked out for him. Um, so the back to the, uh, I get the sense that there's a little bit of Ebenezer Scrooge in you um, in as it relates to marketing and brand. And um, uh, do you feel like, because someone asked at the beginning before you showed up, um, did you swear a lot in the classroom? And I didn't remember you swearing a lot. Um, and you didn't seem like an Ebenezer Scrooge, but this, and it, is it, you think it's getting more amplified as you age and gain more experience and more gray hair that you become more frustrated with the state of marketing and uh, yeah. marketers and brands? I think, and, and look back then you didn't know enough to know what was wrong or right. And that's the other thing. I mean, I have to be honest with you, Aaron, I think being a professor, I mean, I wasn't even 30 then, was I? So, you know, it was a brutally hard job because I didn't fucking know anything. Do you know what I mean? It was, I did a job, I remember, for your cult in Europe and they wanted the marketing professor and I turned up and it was so disappointed that I was <laughs> so young. And I remember being so, I felt so bad for them. Being a professor only gets to be fun in your 50s because you're actually, 
you look like you're meant to know what you're talking about, even if you don't. And you should, if you've done enough work, be experienced enough, you know, if you stay practical. Now, most professors don't, right? And my criticism of American business school professors is they don't do any work. They don't really do consulting. They ask about, and, and they're generally, they're the reason American business schools are a bit stuff now, right? Mm-hmm. I, I adore American business schools. I, I, I went there deliberately in the nights because I loved them and I adored them, but they're in deep, deep shit because the professors aren't practical enough, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and I think, yeah, as I got more experienced and I, I definitely became more Scrooge-like, would probably be fair, but only because I just think it's such a waste of time to not do it well that, you know, and everyone's full of shit. Like you go to these conferences and everyone's so full of shit, right? Such shit gets said at conferences, you know what I mean? And um, I think you have to stand up and say, look, what a lot of bollocks, you know, that's not true. And when you say it, the response from marketers who know what they're talking about is, yeah, that's right. It is a load of shit. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a total load of shit. We know it's shit. And yet no one is saying it. You know what I mean? Mm. And I think that's, you know, that's fundamentally where I found my my niche. I mean, I don't just rail about things. You know, we do we do then do it properly. But yeah, there's so much yeah. shit out there. You, you kind of yeah. can't get, get over it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is everywhere. That is so true. Is that is so true. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's a um, degree of stuff. I'm keeping tabs on the swearing, by the way. The, just so you know, we should all do like a shot of caffeine. Um, every time you <laughs> swear, um, okay. I would love to, Greg Mark. I would love to dig into this because this is fascinating to me. And I took, by the way, your um, Mark, mini MBA marketing class uh, in 2019. Learned a lot. Did and you? I didn't great. know that, Kelly. Did you like it? Of, and I will be taking your brand management course in the spring. That's um, great. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so big, big fan. But I wanted to touch on your um, your foolproof seven point system. For what you say, identifying terrible brand consultants. <laughs> because this was fascinating to me, and I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, steal your thunder. So, could you, could you share, if not all seven points or the entire system, well, just your thoughts on how we identify? Okay, okay now I've got to remember them all. So don't, don't be, don't be disappointed if I forget some of I'm them. Not. So, I wrote an article, and this is ten years ago, by the way. So I'm allowed to forget some of it. Which was, here's how you spot your brand consultant is full of shit, right? And a couple of them, and there are many, many more, right? My favorites, and these are true, by the way, right? Is any use of SWOT or Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells you the person is full of shit, okay? <laughs> SWOT is the biggest pile of ass I've ever met in my life, right? The idea, and we spend, I mean, our lives filling out these four inane boxes, right? And it's not as if at some point in the history of marketing, anyone ever went, oh, look, over in the threats box, our competitor is launching a new brand next year. That's a threat. If we hadn't have built this, this SWAT chat, we never would have seen that. Thank fuck we did that. This changes everything, right? It's the most inane rubbish. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, basically, and I'm not paraphrasing, says, if you really need to take a piss, you stop being hungry. That's what it says. That's literally what it says, right? <laughs> If you need a piss, you don't feel so hungry and you don't worry how you look, right? That's what it says. That's of no use almost anyone. But the reason shit brand consultants use Maslow hierarchy of needs is it sounds really smart, right? And I think I created something like Stagel Humper's Trumpet because I said, all you need is to create some theory that sounds smart and everyone will quote it. You know, Maslow, oh, he sounds clever. A hierarchy of needs, you know? So... They're always, for me, the big watch outs. I can't remember. Do you remember any more, Kelly? What else was in there? You know, you talked about um, a brand consulting um, advisor, the, the number of concepts they try to sell you. So there's no one that's, to oh, that's term, right? That's, or that's very brand important. Brand positioning, brand values, et cetera, et cetera, which I thought was interesting. The number of, the number of, uh, the number of circles in their onion when they're doing brand positioning tells you how good or bad they are, right? If they have more than, I, I look, I'll be honest, I have two. So if you have more than two, in my opinion, then it's that, you know, and there are many, many brand consulting firms that will sell you a dozen. You know, we need your brand essence over here. Then you need your purpose over there. Then you need your brand attributes here. And then, of course, there's brand character and brand ideal and da, 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 da. Right. The, you know, they're selling consulting by the yard. 
the reality is, you know, in, in my world of consulting at this stage, what have I learned from watching it play out? I, th I like to work on brands that, you know, um, have two or three or four things in their, what I would call positioning. We can call it anything you like. What do we stand for? We, we want to be this, this, and this, right? That's what I would call positioning, but you can call it what you like. And then the thing that doesn't get talked about in America, which is such a shame, is the distinctiveness stuff, the codes, um, uh, distinctive brand assets. If you, it, what really, and I love America, so don't take this the wrong way. It's my favorite country. I loved living there for so long. It's the place I learned marketing. America is so far off the pace on brand theory now because of the European movement and the, you know, the, the Ehrenberg Bass stuff. The most important thing I tell everyone in this podcast now, and I've been converted to this by very smart people, and it's a new thing, is that when we talk about branding, if I had to put a number on it, 60, 70, 80% of the job is just coming to mind, just distinctiveness, mm. just being present in the mind of the consumer when the consumer thinks about the product or category. Yeah. Now, when I taught uh, brand management and marketing to Aaron 20 odd more than 25 years ago what I was teaching back then was the standard Keller theory which was you have brand awareness do I know the brand exists that's a gateway now what are the what's the brand image that the consumer has in their head that's where you focus your efforts right tick the box of brand awareness now what do you think when you think about the brand it's the wrong way around everything we've learned about system one and system two about distinctiveness now tells us very clearly that you can call it brand awareness, you can call it salience, but simply cognitively coming to mind, B to B, B to C, high involvement, low involvement, every single category is the biggest challenge. Now, it doesn't mean brand image is unnecessary, but what it tells you is coming to mind and being present is more important, significantly more, which means that when you're positioning brands, sure, the brand positioning and what you want to stand for still has a role but the most important thing you should be doing is working on the codes the distinctive assets which really comes down to whatever are the motifs the images the shapes the colors the fluid assets and again only four or five be choiceful that bring the brand to mind and make the brand look like itself there's nothing i've learned more important than that i was on a call with duracell um last night night before last and they are absolutely on it and the most of the call was about what are the codes of the brand and a little bit was on the positioning, but most of it was on codes and how we drive codes. And that's the right way to do it based on everything I've seen. That is an important acknowledgement and shift. So thank you for sharing that, Mark, because I had read that and I was curious, Aaron, actually, how what you heard back then, 20 years ago, <laughs> and what Mark you're saying today in the courses that I'm taking, and there's a shift, there's an evolution. And thank you for sharing. Yeah. It's very helpful. Yeah, and nice getting Kahneman in there. That was nice. System one and system two was always good. It's, a big, it's a big theory, Aaron. It's a big theory. Mm -hmm. If you read system one, system two, it's a metaphor, but it tells you a lot about the way we decide. You know, for yeah. everyone that's listening, system one is the reptile brain. We make, you know, this morning on the, if you're walking to your office, someone said to you when you stopped off for your coffee, mm -hmm. do you want a, uh, a, a, a cappuccino or do you want a latte? And you said cappuccino. You have no idea why you wanted cappuccino but you said it and thought it with certainty that's system one now if i get you in a focus group or if i get you to fill out a survey why do you prefer cappuccino over cafe latte you'll give me a whole host of horseshit system two explanations that are not the reason yeah <laughs> that's the problem in mark that's the that's problem, the problem right now. you reason. think they're the yeah. reasons they aren't yeah. the reasons it just came to mind yeah i mean just using the word reason messes with it Right. There's, it isn't yeah. a reason. Right. It's just it's there. It hits. Right. Yeah, that's right. That, it is. That's right. It's a it's a whole field of understanding that is definitely in the last 20 to 25 years since you were my professor. Um, we've advanced a lot of knowledge around that, which is really fascinating to see. The, um, the other one I want you to pick on a little bit, even though we don't have a lot of time and I do have to announce our next show is coming up, um, but it's humaning which uh, came out of, I think, Mondelez or somewhere else out there. Yeah, there were no, it's Mondelez, yeah. It's the CMO of Mondelez. It's possibly the biggest load of bullshit I've, um, I've encountered. 
in the last few years. I wrote an article about what a lot of bullshit it was. They want Mondelez want to change marketing to humaning, right? <laughs> and um, I wrote an article and, and I said it is a, a big load of bullshit, but it's not the biggest load of bullshit in marketing. There are many more things that are much bigger bullshit, but it did make my all time top 10 at number nine, which is pretty hard to do. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a wor it's worthy just to study something so stupid. And can, yeah. we, can we talk about that for one second, Aaron? The reason that one of the many reasons it's so stupid and a very important point for marketers again is it's because Mondelez have made the ultimate mistake of thinking that their brand is important, right? It's mm. important to them, their little chocolate bars and their little finicky little things, right? They work on it eight hours a day. So, oh, you know, Cadbury is very important brand. When you swing things around and see it from the point of view of the consumer, which is what marketers are meant to do, what you discover, the first thing you discover, your brand is absolutely a tiny, tiny, tiny thing, right? And no one gives a shit about the brand. Now, that's not a negative thing to say. That's the realistic thing to say. All this horseshit about brand purpose. The pathetic brands. COVID-19. No one gives a fuck what your brand thinks about COVID-19. Nobody in the real world cares. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely essential to realize brands are little things. Mondelez makes chocolate. Yeah, they don't have it's about what your chocolate brand thinks about size things, but don't stay in your lane. A brand is a little thing. Come to mind. Don't waste your time with all this horse shit because it will hurt you in the end. Yeah, that is really good. Okay. Uh, some, yeah. some people have put some links to some of your past articles around that. Uh, unmistakable uh -oh. signs of a shit brand consultant, which I think is uh, yes, it's referencing. Yeah. Um, and if anybody on here does not subscribe and watch and read your stuff, they should be. It's exceptional. Um, marketing week, marketing week. Let's put a plug in because it's yeah, marketing. Yeah, it's free as well. I gave up getting paid, so they put it in front of the paywall. So, yeah, we do marketing week every Wednesday. So, yeah, by all means, it's free content. Who is the athlete behind your right shoulder or our right or your left? Oh no, you've asked, I've got the world's messiest office. Oh, that's a photograph from the first ever Super Bowl when the quarterback, who forgive me, I don't know his name, uh, at halftime had a couple of cigarettes and a beer. It's one of my favorite pictures. I'll show you. Len Dawson. Len Dawson of the Kansas Len City Dawson. Chiefs. Oh, yeah, Dawson. Yeah. The Chiefs player. I, I'm not very au fait with football, but I really enjoyed him taking this moment during the Super Bowl <laughs> to have a fag. And down here, there's a couple of beers. You know, that was halftime. Not the end of the game. Was it halftime? Which does not happen anymore, right? That's a fast, maybe? Oh, that's yeah. good. Well, that's so good. I, I think... American athletes would be better if they stopped for a cigarette every now and again. Do you know what I mean? It would do, actually do them good. Just calm the fuck down, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, that's not my area of expertise. You know what I mean? <laughs> no. If I, get, no. If I get a beer every now and again, it would solve a lot of problems for a lot of athletes, in my opinion. Like, imagine what would happen if a swimmer finished the, like, the Olympic trials and then just casually whipped out a cigarette and a beer at the side of the pool before the next oh. heat man that would that would i'd vote for him That'd be exceptional. Uh, <laughs> that's exceptional that is so good oh uh well this is unfortunate that we have to end we're at the end of our hour and uh you're just getting rolling and this is absolutely amazing and horribly horribly funny thank you for doing this thank you for spending the time with us i want to make sure that everyone knows uh, that we uh, put this on once uh every other week um, we have an amazing number coming up. We have some really interesting people from Lumber Liquidators and from a trade school coming up. And, uh, and, and I've got a delivery package coming, so I've got to go um, as well. <laughs> Mark, if I can put you on the spot really quickly. Um, we have a lot yeah. of questions that came in the chat that we'd love hey, and to I've, follow and up. Keep going. Yeah, let's do a few. Do you want to do a couple now or are we, are we, we're out of time? Or do we're do we're out of time, but if you'd be willing, I'd love to, and I'll follow up with you, send these to you. And if we could get a few answers that we can with this video recording of today's session, um, push that out so that everyone has a chance to have their questions answered. We won't get maybe get to all of them but a few of them i think would be quite interesting yeah i love to do that That'd be yeah great. it's it's fun to do things like that for sure yeah happy to do that we appreciate your time mark this was a wonderful insightful and entertaining conversation to say the least so and are you kelly are you are you doing brand man, uh, mini mba and brand management in april is that I what am. you're doing it i am right, well, look, hey you're gonna love it we um 
I'm looking for, uh, it will be great to see how you do, because you know there's a simulation now, so you, yeah, you get I your share. Yeah, I might skip that part. No, 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 I'm going to watch you. I'm going to yeah. we'll give you a brand to manage, and then you, you, your share price is your grade at the end of the course, um, at the end of the 12 weeks. So I'm, I'm going to keep a special eye on you now, Kelly, uh, see how you do. Thank you. We're looking forward to it, for sure. So, <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you again. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you on our next uh, Think and Link brand. Thank you, everyone. World. Take Thank care, you, everybody. Mark. This was great. Thanks. Bye-bye.